Dynamic technical efficiency is where we look at an economy increasing its capacity to produce over time, in effect shifting the production possibilities frontier out. This implies that we're growing our potential GDP, and it's synonymous with lowering the cost of production over time. Now think about this. Static efficiency is producing on our curve and getting the lowest cost of production at a given point in time. Dynamic efficiency is shifting our potential out and decreasing our cost of production over time. Okay? So static, think of a point in time. Dynamic, think of over time. The ability for an economy to shift its production possibilities frontier out is dependent upon three broad factors. Economic system, resources, and technology. So we're focused on this one in um, this course. So we're going to find that there's certain economic systems that shift a production possibility frontier out faster than other economic systems. In other words, there's some economic systems that are better at cultivating dynamic technical efficiency than other economic systems. Resource increases can also do this. Uh, if we find more uh, natural resources, or we acquire more capital, or we grow the population, those can all shift our production possibilities frontier out, creating a dynamic technical efficiency over time. And then technology, of course, uh, can also do this, getting more out of our resources. Global efficiency, as we might call it, would involve having all of these. We would have a system that would produce the goods that consumers want, allocative efficiency, in a technically efficient way at a point in time and over time. To the extent we don't achieve this global efficiency, then we have what's called deadweight loss. It can come from a lack of allocative static and or dynamic efficiency. We can apply these efficiency criteria to different countries. For example, if we look at uh, France versus Germany uh, after World War II, um, what we see is both countries had systems that created allocative efficiency. Just like most industrialized countries, they had adopted a consumer-driven economy that quickly purges producers that produce goods that aren't right for consumers. Simply put, if you don't produce what consumers want in a marketplace, consumers don't buy it and you go out of business. So both France and Germany were moving closer to allocative efficiency by utilizing the, the market system. When it comes to technical efficiency, however, Germany did better, uh, both statically and dynamically. At any given point in time, we see Germany closer to its production possibility frontier, higher capacity utilization than we would see France. And we also see Germany growing at higher rates over uh, the post-World War II period than France. In fact, Germany became known as the engine of European growth, okay, shifting this curve out faster than many other European countries, France included. To say that Germany was more statically and dynamically efficient is to say that they had less deadweight loss than France and some other European countries. All right, let's move on to the next economic outcome, equity. This is by far the most subjective and contentious one that we look at. Before we get into the debate over what constitutes equity, uh, we need to build some objective measurements of income because the equity question is going to revolve most notably around who gets the income that's generated in a country. The first model we'll build is called the Lorenz curve. It illustrates the cumulative percentage of income earned by the cumulative percentage of households. Let's start with a hypothetical one over here. On the horizontal axis, we put the cumulative percentage of households from zero all the way to 100%. On the vertical axis, we put the cumulative percentage of income, again, from zero to 100%. 
We then bifurcate the axes with a 45 degree line called the line of perfect equality. The implication of this line is that the cumulative percentage of households is equal to the cumulative percentage of income. For example, 20% of households would have 20% of income. 40% of households would have 40% of income. 60% of households would have 60% of income. If this 45 degree line of perfect equality was the actual income distribution in a nation, every household would have the same income. However, that's not the case in any country. So what we do is we illustrate with the Lorenz curve the actual distribution of income. This is hypothetical. We'll look at the real data in a minute. But here we've got 20% of households getting 10% of income, point A. 40% of households getting 25% of income, point B. 60% of households getting 45% of income, C. 80% of households getting about 70% of income, D. And then 100% of households, of course, get 100% of income, point E. Now, what we do is connect the dots and construct our Lorenz curve. This allows us to measure the extent of inequality. The further the Lorenz curve is from the line of perfect equality, the greater the inequality of income. Example, this data here is reflecting the US in 1980, the dark green, and 2016, the light green. You'll note that the Lorenz curve has moved out further away from the line of perfect equality, which means we've increased the amount of income inequality from 1980 to 2016. Another way to identify income inequality is with the Gini coefficient. In fact, this is the most common way that we would quantify income inequality, and it's derived from the Lorenz curve. Take a look at this example here. We've already established that the Lorenz curve is going to deviate from the line of perfect equality. Let's call that deviation area, area A. Okay? And then the remaining area under the right triangle here is gonna be area B. So we can create a formula that quantifies area A as a fraction of area A and B, so A over A plus B. In essence, it's looking at the area of inequality relative to the entire potential area of inequality. Because if this Lorenz curve continues to bow out and out and out, eventually it's going to fill this entire area A and B. That, by the way, would be a perfectly unequal economy, and that would be where one household gets all the income and all other households get nothing. Yeah. By using this formula, we create the metric. If area A is zero, that means the Lorenz curve must be perfectly aligned with the line of equality. Zero over anything is zero. So perfect equality is represented by a Gini of zero. If we had perfect inequality, that would mean area A would occupy this entire space, leaving B zero. If B goes to zero, you have A over A and a Gini of one. So the Gini coefficient will range from zero to one. As we move towards a more unequal income distribution, we get closer to one. As we move towards a more equal distribution, we get closer to zero. So the US here would not only have a Lorenz curve moving further away from the line of perfect equality, we would also see that Gini coefficient moving away from zero and closer to one. Okay? So that's how we can look at changes in income inequality over time in a country. But we could also compare different countries. Here's some data from the CIA fact book and it shows the Gini coefficient uh, for the U.S. in 2007. We were at 45, okay? Uh, and you can compare that to other countries. 
if you scroll up, you can see South Africa has 62, Hong Kong has 53, Jenny, Brazil 48. So the U.S. is lower, less income inequality than those countries. But we have more income inequality than, say, Israel or Russia. Um, continue down some of these countries, if we get to uh, Sweden, for example, only at 24, okay, much less income inequality. All right, so we can look at real data. Here's some data on the Gini for the U.S. over time. So if you go back to 1974, it was 35, and you can see it went up, 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 and it's at its highest level in 2016 at 41. Now keep in mind that income is usually the focus when it comes to these equity questions, but we could do this same analysis with the distribution of wealth, right? What people own. Uh, and we would see even more unequal income distribution um, in, in pretty much every country than we see with income. We're going to stick with income, though, because it's the most highly debated. This illustration here color codes by country uh, the Gini index. So it gives you kind of global insight into where inequality is more uh, severe and where it's less severe. Uh, for example, you'll notice that the greens tend to imply lower Gini coefficients. You got Canada, right? You've got Western Europe, parts of Africa, Australia, and then the reds imply that we have more inequality. So the U.S., South America, other parts of Africa, Southern Africa, China, Russia. The map tells us undoubtedly there is diversity across the globe in the income distribution. It doesn't, however, tell us if that's good or bad. That's subjective, and it depends on who you talk to. Some people are proponents of the equal opportunity theory that says if a country gives people equal opportunity, which means government does not stand in your way in achieving your potential, then whatever the distribution that results from that is fair, equitable. If you work harder or you save more or you have uh, natural talents that make you more valuable to other people, you're going to have a higher income than those that don't do those things. In contrast, people that are proponents of the equal outcome theory uh, believe that uh, distribution should be based on state intervention. Okay, uh, In other words, even if you work hard or you have natural talents, uh, you should not be able to get a higher income than someone that, ha that doesn't have those characteristics. And the state should be a mechanism that ensures equal outcomes. So if you're a great singer, for example, or a great athlete in the equal opportunity theory, you would get a higher income because you're going to be much more valuable to others. They're going to be throwing their money at you to see you perform. But in the equal outcome theory, whatever excess income you get from people that don't possess those talents would be redistributed away from you to them. Of course, it's common to have a mixed evaluation where maybe you promote equal opportunity, but then use government subsidies, taxes, and transfers uh, in order to redistribute funds away from some higher income earners to some lower income earners. Not attempting to get a perfectly equal outcome in the distribution, but trying to remedy things like poverty and uh, providing for those that can't provide for themselves. Okay, uh, These mixed evaluations are what are most common today across the globe. Uh, for example, in the U.S., we have some equal opportunity in that gov government doesn't significantly infringe on your ability to uh, move up in income, but we also have an uh, element of equal outcome where the government will uh, transfer and tax you as you earn more income to subsidize people that have special circumstances like the poor or the disabled or those that um, can't take care of themselves. So that's the mixed evaluation in the U.S. Okay? All right, that's it for this section. We'll pick up with the next economic uh, outcome uh, indicator in the next video. Thanks.